morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Orlando and the National Space Society's 16th International Space Development Conference. My name is Michael Gilbrook, and I have the honor of being the chair for this year's ISDC. And now, to officially open the conference, I'd like you all to please stand for the procession of flags of the spacefaring nations. The United States of America, Russia, the People's Republic of China, Japan, Canada, Italy, India, Israel, and France. Ever. So you may want to check with Krieger Publishing and see if they have any other books by uh, 
by Joan. Particularly relevant to our presentation on Cold War international cooperation and competition in space today, Dr. Johnson Fries has written a book entitled Changing Patterns of International Cooperation and Competition in Space. That's the one I believe Krieger has up there. She's written books on the Japanese space program, a comparative study of the US, Japan, and European space agency efforts with Roger Hanford, articles on the Russian space program, and is currently writing a book on the Chinese space program. She's a faculty member with the International Space University and on the Committee on International Programs for the Space Sciences Board of the National Academy of Sciences. So I think you can see from her bio, Joan is eminently well qualified to talk to us today about becoming a space-bearing planet and the issues involved in international cooperation and competition in space. Joan has been a good friend to the National Space Society and to the Metro Orlando Space Society for many years, and I'd now like to have you please join me in welcoming Dr. Joan johnson Fries. Whether cooperation means jointly build hardware, 
integrated hardware, coordinated missions, or joint participation of some form is becoming less and less important. What is increasingly important is how we define the success of the program. Countries operate <coughs> in space or in any other field because they want to optimize the potential to reach some goal. Sometimes cooperation can even make two or two and two yield more than four. You can get more by working together. But clearly cooperation isn't done for nebulous reasons. It's goal oriented. Even in the days when the United States could afford cooperation for the payback of only political goodwill. During the height of the Cold War, that was a valuable strategic commodity. The need for all parties to feel that the cooperation has been beneficial makes the imperative for defining the goals of international projects distinctly, openly, and honestly an absolute essential. Defining goals may seem easy, and it may indeed seem obvious. I would argue that it hasn't been, and it shouldn't be taken for granted. If you look at any space project, and I mean a national project, even before looking at an international project, uh, you will see that you are inherently <coughs> dealing with at least three different sets of goals. Complementary, but not identical. The goal of the engineer who builds a spacecraft or piece of hardware is to have it operate successfully. They breathe a lot easier after the launch. The goal of the scientist or the person utilizing the equipment is to receive useful data or results. The goal of the program manager is to have the project completed on time and within budget. These goals can come into conflict. If you carry extra batteries for backup power to satisfy the engineer, then that space and weight can't be used by the scientists for their experiments. If you make the spacecraft bigger to satisfy both, you're likely adding cost to the program, which will perturb the program manager. A friend of mine with NASA, who is a space scientist, said when space scientists die, they go to a heaven where there are no program managers. <laughs> but in the meantime, they've got to operate within certain parameters. It is likely that the goals can be made to be compatible, or at least workable, but only after everyone openly states their goals, making communication key. From here, it's only a matter of extrapolation to see that the same set of issues comes into play on international programs, with others added, likely in terms of utilization. <coughs> Stating goals in the beginning also allows the goals to drive hardware, hardware rather than the other way around. If we can all conceptually agree that it's nice to have a set of goals before blueprints are drawn up, then we need to explore the communication aspects of setting and stating these goals. Working with the military these past few years uh, has introduced me to hundreds of colloquialisms and slogans that I never knew before, ranging from things having to do with salami slicing the budget to wolves at the lead dog of sled pack and on and on and on, which I have no idea what they really mean. <laughs> uh, but one that I was familiar with from teaching international relations was know your enemy. Perhaps it was because that adage was so widely uh, accepted in business as well as in politics that I was familiar with it. But what amazes me is that in the post-Cold War era, there has been no updated adage emerge along the lines of know your partner. Having written books on the European, Japanese, and now the Chinese space program, I am constantly amazed at how little potential partners know about each other's cultures, legal, political, and bureaucratic systems. There is an assumption that things work the same in Beijing, as in Tokyo, as in Paris, as within the DC Beltway, and it's simply not true. The private sector seems to be catching on much faster than governments in this regard. 
they want to maximize their return on investment and so give their employees preparation as to what to expect and how to be effective in working with others. I have not found the same to be true to at least the same degree either within government agencies or concerning government funded projects. This is not a uniquely American problem either, though I would suggest the lack of foreign language skills of most Americans, myself included, uh, is not just embarrassing but a hindrance. One cannot truly understand the culture in any depth without speaking at least some of the language. I kind of throw that out as a challenge reminder <coughs> to educators. Uh, I'd offer a couple examples of what I mean about cultural differences impacting decision making, drawn particularly from my experience researching my earlier book on Japan. Spending eight months in Japan researching the book was a phenomenal learning experience, and I must say, I learned as much by sending my son to a Japanese public school and shopping at the neighborhood cooperative grocery store as I did uh, from anything formal. I would regularly give talks while I was there on subjects ranging from international cooperation in space to the life of a liberated American woman. And I didn't choose the topic or the title, but I found constantly having women's group ask me to talk about that. Um, once while I was talking about space, I referred to the then annual congressional battle over space station funding. Afterwards, three Japanese gentlemen came up and they apologized in advance for the, what they were sure was just a simple misunderstanding. You see, they explained to me, President Reagan had invited Japan to participate on the space station. Therefore, it couldn't possibly be canceled. <laughs> well, in response, I found myself babbling about authorization and appropriation subcommittees and downsizing and peace dividends that weren't going to materialize because of the growing deficit payments. It sounded inane to me, so I can only imagine how it sounded to them. On the other hand, I sometimes ask questions about how the Japanese bureaucracy worked, and after conversations that sounded much like an Abbott Costello dialogue about who's on first, my secretary would throw up her hands and say, because. <laughs> Accommodating different cultures and different systems is mightily managed by the bureaucracies. But if the government is looking for a way to encourage international cooperation, identifying and mitigating some of these structural roadblocks in advance, once and for all, would be a good place to start. It would save individuals from having to come up with agreements such as the Tamamushi Agreement, which facilitated cooperation between NASA and ISIS on the Solar Aid Project in 1986. What happened there was that NASA and ISIS, which is the Japanese space agency dealing with space science projects, had differing bureaucratic regulations to the extent that the scientists who were involved in the project were afraid that the cooperation wouldn't be possible. The scientists, however, and I would add a caveat here that I think space scientists are about the craftiest bunch of radar O'Reilly's I've ever come across. They can make anything work. We're determined to make a solar a cooperative venture. So they came up with this Tamamushi agreement. Tamamushi refers to an iridescent Japanese beetle, which if you look at it from one angle, it looks to be a particular color. But if you look at the same beetle from a different angle, it appears to be a different color. That was the premise of this agreement. If you looked at it from one perspective, it fit the NASA requisite requirements. If you looked at it from another perspective, it fit the Japanese requirement. And from what the scientists told me, what the agreement basically did was nothing. They wrote it so general and vague that it meant nothing but it checked the bureaucratic box. Very clever, but they shouldn't have to work this way, is the broader point. Other types of cultural issues abound. The book I'm currently writing on China has proven to be perhaps my greatest challenge yet. 
with 5,000 years of continuous history, one cannot neglect the impact of culture on their decision-making style and process. In China, for example, I was surprised at how difficult it is to get documentation about anything Chinese. I'm not referring to reports, papers, laws, or policy statements. I'm referring to an organizational chart or mission statement for an organization. Whereas in the United States and Europe, a researcher can quickly be buried in documentation that agencies and companies are thrusting upon them, and China just asking for it can raise apprehensions. I was also surprised in China, I did a very informal um, kind of survey through interpreters asking people to <coughs> engage what was the level of public knowledge about space. And I was very surprised, even in the larger cities, I, I would start the interview by just simply asking if they knew who Neil Armstrong was. I didn't find one person who did. The level of public knowledge is just so much different in different countries, depending on their priorities. Um, and retrospectively, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised at that because their emphasis is in different areas right now. But then there's the United States. With a history of just over 200 years and a culture, that some people say uh, has yet to develop. America is a country difficult for others to understand, perhaps mostly because they resist believing that Americans are as culturally superficial and anomalous as they initially come across. Much to our own amusement, however, satirist Dave Barry regularly and effectively depicts in his newspaper columns the many ways in which America is indeed a cultural oddity. One need not long ponder the meaning or linkage of the home shopping channel, full combat wrestling, tent revivals, or rap music to American historical roots, but only to realize that Americans will embrace it for some period of time and then reject it like Snapple and move on. The point is, we need to learn more about each other to understand what is important and what isn't. Having given some conceptual parameters, I'd like to spend the next couple of minutes talking about changes in the post-Cold War era specifically. Space policy in the United States, <coughs> for better or for worse, has always been a subset of foreign and defense policy. I wish we could say that there have been politicians, uh, cum funders, who have looked to the heavens and seen the opportunity to explore just out of curiosity, or even for the more pragmatic economic or developmental potential that space offers. But the record shows us otherwise. Our ulterior motive has always been linked to foreign and defense policy. Little, it seems, has changed in the post-Cold War era. That's not a statement of judgment. It's merely a statement of parameters within which the government has operated. I personally don't think this is an optimal or even a rational way to work. And that entire topic is the subject of the book that my former colleague from UCF, Roger Hanberg, and I uh, have written that Michael mentioned, Space the Dormant Frontier, which just the title tells you something. But that's the way that things have been. What has changed is both the size of the matrix and the focus of the individual players. Whereas for many years, U.S.-European cooperation was the focus of attention, now the United States is looking towards Russia and the Trans-Pacific more and more. For other countries, for many years, the United States was the only game in town for launch. But that changed first with the Ariane, and then the Long March, and then the Proton, and the list is increasingly expanding. Finally, I'd like to talk about the future. What might one expect to find in international cooperation looking back from 2020? The military is always doing that. Let's skip forward some number of years and then look back and try and, try and see what we might see. Well, I would suggest we might see three general trends. First, politics will no longer be reason in and of itself for cooperative ventures. 
There was a time when warm political feelings of goodwill were enough in return for cooperation. But in today's tight economy, that is no longer the case. And of course, there's, there is economic growth. We are in a, a, a boom time, so to speak, economically. But when you look at the federal government money available, there is increasingly less and less new money for these projects. Uh, the deficit is basically consuming what we had hoped would be a peace dividend. Definable returns on investment will be required, especially in multi-party <coughs> ventures where the political goals of one party will not make up for the economic, scientific, or technical goals of another party. Second, we would likely see a continuation of the same kinds of successes we have seen in the past from the space science community, if funding stabilizes. Driven by common external scientific goals, as I said earlier, these people are absolutely ingenious at bridging cultural gaps over, as they tell me, this is not first-hand experience, a beer, vodka, sake, or muta, as the case may be. Ending up with program, programs like Pathfinder, International Solar Terrestrial Physics, Geotail, Topex Poseidon, and the list goes on and on. I added the caveat, if the funding stabilizes, to indicate, however, that even scientists must report to their program managers, and ending up with 30, 40, or 50% of a canceled program, in other words, 50% of nothing, is neither easy to sell nor worth potential savings. <clears throat> At the very least, tenuous budgets drive cooperation to being defined as coordination of discrete hardware. That's not necessarily bad, but it's increasingly making any other option unlikely. In conjunction with the former, I see governments taking on more of a facilitator role rather than a designer role in international cooperation. And I'm going to make a big leap of faith here, and maybe this is more uh, one of wishful thinking than actual pragmatic extrapolation forward, and say that perhaps we will learn from experience and move from the model where accountants and lawyers get space stations to one where lawyers and accountants find way to implement programs designed by engineers and scientists in response to policies set by decision makers. And that truly must be a futuristic world if it's one where policies match programs. Uh, everybody has a role, but those roles are different. To achieve success under any definition, communication is key. Finally, uh, I would expect to see more and more space development activity gradually moving into the private sector, and we're seeing that today. Although that is inherently, that inherently means competition, I view this as ultimately positive in the long run. The private sector is motivated by, motivated by a constant goal, profit, rather than a fluctuating goal, like foreign policy. Therefore, as long as there is the profit to be made, or at least the potential for profit, not only will operational funding be more stable, but continued stable investment will also be possible, or in, in R&D will be possible also. It's there that I see organizations like the International Space University, which I've been affiliated with for a long time, and the National Space Society, which I've also had the pleasure of being affiliated with, as providing ideas. It will be critical to have groups such as this providing ideas. Where we move away from space being a science project or a jobs program and become a development field. Uh, further, the global economy will foster cooperation at a much extended level in the private sector. <laughs> Governments have been unable to rally the political will and subsequent dollars for manned space exploration since the days of Apollo. But perhaps the private sector can do it, motivated by profit. And I would add just a comment here on political will. Um, a couple, 
uh, two years ago at the anniversary of the 100th 100 manned space flight, I had lots of calls from reporters wanting comments on what did this event mean? Was this a, a milestone positive or was this a milestone uh, somehow showing that we have not gone as far as we wanted? And I found myself giving what I thought were brilliant, insightful academic responses. But you could always tell when an interview's not going well, when you don't hear the reporter scratching on the other end, when there's no keys typing, there was just dead silence. And um, about the third time this happened, and it happened to be with a Japanese newspaper, I finally, in frustration, said, well, let me give you an example the other, uh, from the Caribbean night at the dinner table. When my then 11-year-old son, watching a CNN report about uh, a shuttle near docking, made the comment, Mom, why is it everybody's getting all excited about uh, a docking that we knew we could do in 1975? In 1969, we could go to the moon, and now we're all excited about lower orbit. <laughs> and you know, when I said that, I could hear the reporters scratching frantically at the other end. <laughs> and he ended up quoting my son. And <laughs> so I guess well, thank you for having me and not my son today. Um, but the point is, that was a function of political will, not technology. So political will is something that we can't just disregard. The private sector isn't bound by that kind of political will, though they are uh, beholden to profit returns. The key there will be for the private sector to be able to step beyond the short term or at least to develop, develop what I refer to as parallel development plans, where they can garner enough short-term profit to look to the future for long-term planning. Uh, according to historical records, when Lewis and Clark went to the American Northwest, the justification for their trip was twofold, showing the flag and economics. The economics aspect stemmed from an anticipated boom beaver skin hats. Lewis and Clark were to identify and map potential beaver sources. Well, just as I would think that the prime economic return of opening the American West has been beaver skin hats, uh, I similarly don't think we can predict and pinpoint a single economic reason for space development. It really is going to be go there and you will, you know, build it and they will come. I don't think we can anticipate exactly why or exactly the profit source that we will get from space. Consortiums of companies willing to invest for the long term will be our pioneers of the future. These consortia of international and multinational companies working together will be the trend. Fundamentally, I see the opportunities for international cooperation in the, in the post Cold War world as expanding, perhaps in ways which will initially be uncomfortable for some, but better for all in the long run. Those who are most knowledgeable about a situation are best able to identify opportunities as they arise and take advantage of them. This conference is an opportunity for all of us to be more aware and more knowledgeable. But then it's up to us to take advantage of the situations to expand all of our horizons. Thank you.
there's a usual, there's kind of the usual suspects who talk about space. We love, you know, space advocates, we love to talk to each other. We, we just love to get together and talk about how, how happy we are about the way things are going or not going, but we talk to each other, preach to the choir. And I decided that this is perpetuating, along with governments, um, kind of a suppression of the entrepreneur qualities for which I think America, which makes America great. So I went to my son's school and I talked to uh, all the fourth and fifth grades. And um, I asked these kids what they thought they'd like to do in space. Gee, if you could do anything from space, what would you do? It was amazing, the responses I got. What really scared me is how many of them came to fruition within about a year. The one that everybody wanted to do was, this was at the height of um, uh, Nintendo when it was coming. And they all said, let's have a satellite that does nothing but beam down video games. Well, I think they now call it the Sega channel. You know? <laughs> uh, uh, another, another little boy said, well, you know, my dad always comes that the only time our sprinkler system goes on is when it's raining. Why can't the satellite turn off the sprinkler system if it's raining? And somebody else said, well, you know, my mom's trying to put in a security system, and how come the satellite can't watch our house? And the list went on and on and on. And I guess what this is leading to is I can't tell you specifically where small businesses will come into it, but I think we're beginning to think out of what was the accepted norm, that if you can't watch a satellite, well, you're out of it. Uh, and we're beginning to think more in entrepreneurial spirit, which will open a lot, of, a lot more opportunities on the small scale as well as the big scale. I hope that's the case anyway. Yes? There's one example of navigation I just saw that's coming into use. The uh, state legislature in Texas is working on passing a law authorizing
to move to this, this energy source. And I would agree with you 100%. I would remind you that in 1979, there was a large conference in Washington on exactly that issue. But of course, at that time, we were in a political era where small was beautiful. And when you had suggestions for football field size reflectors in space, everyone went, oh, you know, we can't do this, we can't do this. Well, um, it was politically incorrect at the time. It also, um, I'll tell you what, those energy, the existing energy companies that you mentioned are not real anxious to see this reach fruition and have been very active in um, stymieing efforts. Interestingly enough, the Japanese are moving full speed ahead. When I, when I was there, I talked to them a lot about their solar power satellite projects, and they made the comment to me said, you know, Americans are so funny. You go into things with such gusto. He said, that's so interesting for us. He said, if you're going to do it, you jump in, both feet, you know, really do it in a big way. He said, we just don't do this. And he gave me an analogy. He said, it's like a field of rice. He said, if you found a new strain of rice, you'd rip up all the old stuff and plant the whole field with the new strain. He said, we can't do that. We take one row and plant with the new strain, and if that works, well, then we improve on it a little. And then we do two rows and three, and we incrementally move forward. And he said, that's how we're approaching solar power satellites. He said, we're moving into it slowly but consistently. And he said, you know, that also helps overcome the political problems. Said, but in the States, when you jump right in, uh, he said it makes it kind of politically in your face. But I would also mention that Peter Glazer, the renowned expert in this, in this field, has worked in Japan for about the past 10 years because they're the ones who are interested. Yes? Uh, interestingly, there was going to be a talk here uh, by Seth Potter, uh, who unfortunately is not able to come here on, on solar power and information from orbit for a safe environment. Uh, he gave that same talk at uh, Space Studies Institute uh, a week or so ago. And uh, it, uh, this is an idea from Seth Potter and Marty Hoffman at New York University. And basically the idea is uh, instead of trying to uh, get into the solar power satellite business at first or you know, the frontal approach, you sort of get in by the side by uh, expanding the size of those communication satellites. You know, sort of like the teledesic. Uh, you know, suppose you increase the size of their collectors and now it's sort of gaining power, the power of their computers, so that they can absorb the information and now sort of get into the side wall. Incrementalism might be the way to go. I think one more question here for Joe. Yeah. Um, I realize that you know, you're a big fan of cooperation and you would like to see the public sector take space and go forward with it. Um, how do you see the governments of the world being able to, in their view, probably compromise their security on certain issues? Do you still see that? I mean, right now space is a part of, as you said, part of our security and defense issues. How well do you think the governments of the world will respond to a change having so much space how we're being in the private sector instead of in their hands? Well, at, in my current position at the Air War College, trust me, they talk about this a lot. And again, that's, as Michael mentioned, this is one of the reasons I wanted to, to go there is because I don't think it's appropriate any longer to talk about the civil program, the military program. There is the space program. Um, interestingly, I think in many fields, well, first of all, there's the economic issue. Economics is certainly going to drive um, some parts of this, this entire problem. And when I talk about uh, convergence and conversion, these are two very distinctly different uh, processes, I think we're going to have a lot more success with conversion, taking some existing facilities that are dual use, or that are singular use and making them dual use. Uh, where applicable, uh, where there is not a, um, a security problem. The problem 
that you're going to have is convergence of getting two groups to come together and work together because there you really run into the potential national security issues. Um, I am particularly concerned. I am an advocate of cooperation. What, I, what concerns me the most is where we are basing cooperation on a current set of foreign or defense policy guidelines. As we all know, foreign policy changes. You know, we go through changes on a regular basis. And when we plan long-term programs on tenuous <coughs> political ties, and here I mean hardware. I'm going to build a piece of hardware, and you're going to supply it, and I have to add it to that premise, I hope. Um, in the national security field, I think that becomes very questionable. A friend of mine at the Air War College Lieutenant Colonel Kathy Sweet got an editorial in Space News about two weeks ago dealing with that specifically, uh, that we really can't let the hardware slip away from us in national security projects, and this one in particular that she was writing about was the EELV program. Thank you very much, Mike, for the We have a few conference announcements here. Uh, those of you that still have some questions, perhaps you can approach Dr. Johnson Fries uh, uh, right after uh, I finish my remarks here. Uh, I think she'll be able to stick around for a few minutes and handle questions uh, uh, before our next session starts at 10.30. Um, some announcements. Uh, first off, uh, we will have an audio tape vendor, Magna Media Incorporated, will be operating a set of tables uh, outside the exhibit hall uh, up in our uh, uh, conference area. So if there's any uh, audio tapes you want to obtain of uh, any of the talks uh, during the conference, uh, see them. They'll have uh, registration forms uh, for you to pick uh, which uh, sessions you would like to obtain a tape of. We have a help desk that we've established upstairs. If you look in the back of your conference program, there's a map showing the layout of all the function space, all the salons and meeting rooms. And you'll see the registration desk on the second floor has been designated the help desk. The idea here is that we want to give you a single point of contact where if you need pretty much anything, you can start there. If that person can't help you, he or she will tell you where to go so that you've got one place you can go and, and try to obtain assistance. Uh, there will be a few things that we'll distribute there at the help desk. One will be a daily newsletter. Uh, this will have uh, special points of interest for uh, programs occurring that day. Uh, also, that will include any changes in the program, deletions, additions, uh, moves in the program. So look for that newsletter up there. We'll have that on the desk. Um, there's also a message board, a court message board next to the help desk. Uh, you're welcome to uh, uh, write a message to somebody else at the conference and leave it and post it on that board. Um, so just check the person at the help desk there for that. Uh, we ask that if that, uh, you have a message up that uh, uh, is no longer valid, uh, problem been taken care of. If you could just come up and remove your message so we don't end up with a lot of outdated messages, that would be appreciated. We will also have a, uh, a freestanding uh, display uh, in the center of the uh, salon area. Uh, it's a bright blue display that has a sign on it that says ISDC conference information. Uh, this will be for the posting by the staff of uh, notices, again, of, of uh, meeting room changes or uh, where various meetings of the board of directors are going to be or various committees. We ask that you not post notices on that yourself. Uh, go to the help desk. If you want to have a sign, if you're having, say, uh, a special uh, activist committee meeting and you want to arrange it in a given room at a given time, uh, see the person at the help desk. We'll help you get that, that room scheduled. We'll help you make the sign, and we'll post the sign on that display for you. That has to use Velcro. We can't stick tacks in that. So we'd ask that you not try to put signs on that yourself. Let's see. Uh, OK. Also, uh, we still have some tickets available for two tours. One today, uh, the uh, KSC afternoon tour, which I believe leaves at noon from the uh, back registration area. I believe we still have some seats available on that, so if you're interested in seeing the cake, this is a, a half-day tour. Uh, we leave about noon and return about 6 o'clock tonight. Um, you'll uh, get the uh, 
tour of the shuttle facilities, you'll see the Apollo Saturn V exhibit, and you'll have some time to spend in the visitor center. Uh, there's not an IMAX film involved, but uh, you'll get to see most everything else. Uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, go see the registration desk and they can sign you up for the remaining seats on that. Once that's sold out, that's it. We've got 97 seats, and that's about, or I'm sorry, 47 seats. Once that's sold out, that's, that'll be all that we have. Um, same deal for uh, the Space Camp event, which is being held tomorrow from uh, 6 to midnight. Uh, there will be a bus coming back an hour earlier than that uh, uh, for those people who wear out earlier. Um, but uh, I do believe we have some tickets available for that. So once again, see registration if you're interested in that event. We also have a few meal events left. We had to give the hotel the final meal counts a couple of days ago, but uh, there is a short, a slight overage that they uh, anticipate when we give them that final count. Uh, so there may be some meal event tickets available. So if there was a meal event you were interested in going to uh, and you missed the deadline, go to registration and they're handling that on a first come, first aid and serve basis. Uh, uh, but they're very, very limited. We only have uh, probably two, three, four tickets for any given meal of that remaining. So if you're interested in doing that, now's the time to look into it. Uh, one more note, uh, uh, we had a change. Many of you are aware about it. Uh, if you were pre-registered to the conference, you received a notification in the mail uh, that we had to change the, the talks for Ben Bova, who originally was gonna be tomorrow morning's plenary speaker and Robert Zubrin, who was going to be tomorrow uh, uh, afternoon's uh, meal speaker for lunch. Uh, because of schedule conflict, we switched those, so tomorrow morning's plenary session will be Robert Zubrin on uh, uh, Mars exploration and settlement, and uh, the uh, speaker at lunch will be Ben Bova, the science fiction uh, and fact writer. Uh, I'm not sure there's any tickets still available for Ben Bova's talk, but again, check the registration. At any rate, uh, once again, welcome to the conference. I'm glad to see you all here. Uh, feel free to approach me if you have any questions, uh, if you see me wandering in the hallway. Um, and uh, have a good time. Thank you.